Mercy, peace to you from Jesus Christ our Lord, from God the Father and Christ our Lord Jesus. Amen. Have you noticed recently that the word so has entered into our language, speaking of language, as a filler word, right? Have you noticed this? So people will start with so, and then they'll answer something. Um, um, that's a filler word, or like, 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 that's a filler word. And my one that I struggle with the most is a phrase, you know, you know, way too much, right? But anyway, even on the news, sometimes when someone's being interviewed, the interviewee will start the answer with, so, such and such, this and that. It's become a new filler word in our language. Or one TV comedy I was watching, there were two characters and they were enemies against each other. And this one woman said to this other woman, basically something like, well, you don't measure up like I do. So, and then she left. And the one that was offended looked at her friends like, did she just finish the conversation with so? <laughs> You kind of had to see the TV show. It wasn't as funny as I'm, as I'm describing it. But anyway, our, our reading today begins with the word so, but it wasn't a filler word. So Moses went out. Huh. That word so tells us that we're at the end of a story. There were several other things that had happened before when Moses said this. Would that all of the Lord's people were prophets. I wish, would, I wish that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Moses is speaking words to bring to conclusion a long series of events that's happened well before our story, what we read today in Numbers. Well, remember who he spoke these words to? He spoke these words to Joshua, right? Because Joshua wanted two guys to quit prophesying. These words of Moses were prophetic. Now, he probably didn't realize he was prophesying. He probably didn't realize that they would be fulfilled many years later, that they would ha be fulfilled on Pentecost Sunday. Sunday. He probably didn't realize. The next click will show that, I think. Moses wished that the Lord would put his spirit... Oh, I'm sorry. Let's go back. I was wrong there. Moses wished that the Lord would put his spirit on all of God's people. Well, on that first Pentecost, Moses' wish came true. And ever since, the Holy Spirit has been placed on God's people in a greater way, in a grander way, you could say, than it had been before the first Pentecost. So we've got pre-Pentecost Holy Spirit, same Holy Spirit, don't get me wrong, and we've got post-Pentecost, the workings of the Holy Spirit. First, let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, you probably remember the, the context of Moses in Numbers 11, I would assume so. You know what happened. This true story. God's people were slaves in Egypt, and they had been slaves for hundreds of years. They were crying out to God to deliver them from slavery. The Lord heard their plea, and so he chose Moses to confront the king Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. But Pharaoh would not budge. Pharaoh would not let these slaves go. Why would he? He was successful. The empire was great as long as he had these probably up to two million slaves working for him. So the Lord sent plagues on Egypt to try to get Pharaoh's attention. Still nothing except finally the last plague got Pharaoh's attention as Pharaoh's son died as the firstborn. Well, through Moses, the Lord then led them out of Egypt through the Red Sea, part of the Red Sea, finally up to Mount Sinai, where the Lord gave his people his law, his Torah, his instructions for life. Meanwhile, the people of Israel, while Moses was up on Sinai, they were down the base of the, the, the mountain, acting more like Egyptians than they were the people of God. They had fashioned for themselves a golden calf, an idol to worship to take the place of the one true God, Yahweh. Well, after the Lord dealt with that situation, they moved on closer to the promised land where he was taking them, the land of Canaan. And so Moses sent in spies to check out the land. Ten of the 12 spies, they lacked faith. And they came back with a bad report. Oh, we can't do this. We can't do that. It's too dangerous. Well, this led the people to rebel against Moses and to rebel against God. And he disciplined them. The Lord disciplined them for their lack of faith. Every one of them who were 20 years old and older 
would never see the promised land. He would have them still spend 40 years wandering in the desert before the ones 20 years old and under would finally make it to the promised land. Well, think about this. That's the size of a small city, well, actually a pretty large-sized city. There was probably a million and a half to two million people who were living like nomads, these Israelites, for 40-some years. That's a lot of mouths to feed, and that's a lot of eating the same old manna day after day after day. Sure, it tasted okay, but can you imagine eating the same thing day after day for 40 years? I'm told that my dad... <laughs> He loves peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. He ate them every single day during his working life. He just loved peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And so mom would make him peanut butter and jelly sandwich every single day. But most people <laughs> who are not Ed Wheeler, love you, Dad, if you're watching this on the Internet, love you, Dad. Most people do not want to eat the same thing every single day for 40 years, and that's exactly what the Israelites did. Can you imagine, let's say, eating peanut butter and jelly or oatmeal every single day for 40 years? You would probably complain too, and complain they did. Oh, it got really bad. Well, of course, the Lord heard their complaints. He loves them. They're his kids. They're his children that he chose for himself, but their complaints never stopped. So he sent them quail to eat. Well, maybe they would like this instead. But then they had so much quail to eat for a month that it was like that it was coming out of their noses there was so much quail. God did that on purpose. You want quail? I'll give you quail. So much that it's coming out of your nostrils. That's how much. And they began to, began to hate quail too. Poor Moses. Poor Mo Can you imagine being Moses? He had a tough job. He was worn down and about ready to throw in the towel. He even got asked God to take his life. Just shoot me now, it almost like he was saying. Now, I don't know exactly how to interpret this, but one, one of our sisters in Christ when coming out of the early service today said, Pastor, do you ever feel like Moses? <laughs> like, what are, you, what are you saying? Am I giving off a real big vibe that I'm feeling like this is, a, I got, just shoot me now? No, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, but God answered Moses' prayer by giving him 70 elders. I will say that God has answered my prayers and the congregation's prayers. We have wonderful elders at this church. My dad, again, speaking of my dad, he's a country boy from Indiana, and he said, boy, you better be thanking the good Lord for them elders of yours. You better be thanking the good Lord for them elders. And I said, Dad, I do thank the good Lord a lot for the elders of peace. So anyway, Yahweh gave to Moses, gave the children of Israel 70 elders, and that made his life a lot better because not everything came to him. Can you imagine? You're the leader of a nation, two million people, million and a half to two million people, and you had to decide everything. You had to be the judge of right and wrong. If someone had a complaint against somebody else, Moses had to be the one to decide everybody's complaint. God brought alongside Moses 70 elders to assist him in this role of leading his people Israel. And then they would start deciding many of the issues, and if they couldn't, then they would then escalate it up to Moses at that point. But his life got a lot better. Well, the Lord affirmed these new servants in a very dramatic way. Look at this. Read this with me. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the Spirit rested on them, they prophesied. But what was odd? I mean, that's a beautiful thing. Can you imagine? I mean, that was a miraculous, amazing gift of the Holy Spirit that wasn't that common back then, right? But what was odd was this. More than just the 70 elders started to prophesy. There were two guys that were in the camp, away from where they were, that they started to prophesy too. Their names were Eldad and Medad. Well, Someone heard them prophesying, and so he runs and he tells Moses, and standing next to Moses is Joshua, his assistant, his aide, remember? And he says, look, they're prophesying in the camp. And Joshua turns to Moses and said, my Lord Moses, make them stop. Have them stop. Moses, in the next click there, next click right there, then Moses tells Joshua, oh, I wish that all of the Lord's people were prophets, all of them that the Lord would put his spirit on all of God's people. You see, at this point in time, he'd only put it on certain people for certain roles or tasks. 
within the people of Israel now. He's putting on 70 of them, which is a lot, but not on all of God's people, just on 70 of them, you see. You know, when, when Moses said that, he probably didn't realize he was prophesying but he was. Jesus Christ, in his life, his death, and his resurrection, did everything necessary for your salvation. To save you from sin, to save you from the power of the devil, to save you from eternal death and hell, Jesus did it all through his life, death, resurrection, his ascension, all of it. But 10 days after Jesus ascended it back to the Father, he sent the Holy Spirit in a very dramatic and powerful way. He poured out the Holy Spirit. And now the Holy Spirit was for all of God's people, not just for Moses, not just for David, not just for kings or prophets or priests, not just for the 70 elders, but now the Holy Spirit is meant for all of God's people. That means the Holy Spirit is meant for you too. And when you were baptized into the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, you were given the Holy Spirit. Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and he says, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You now are indwelled with the Holy Spirit. As you believe and are baptized, you are indwelled with the Holy Spirit. He's been poured out on all of God's people. Some say that Pentecost is like the opening of the floodgates of a dam. And the Spirit just bursts forth, right? And He creates the church and He grows the church. And I can see that. I like that analogy. But let me just put a little bit of a, a tweak on that analogy, if you could, if I could. When a dam is built for, to provide hydroelectric power, right? The water comes through. It creates electricity, hydroelectric power. Some of the river continues to go on down before the, flip, the switch is flipped. That's right. The water continues down the river at a meager pace, and that's all fine and good, it's beautiful. And the water provides drinking and for bathing for the people along the river, and it provides water for gardens and for agriculture along the river. And, and you know where the reservoir is created by the dam, there's recreation, there's fishing and jet skiing and all those types of things. So the river definitely blesses the people and along the way, right? And that's a great thing, but when the switch is thrown, and the water runs through the dam to create hydroelectric power. Something bigger and ex ex dynamic happens. When it has gone through the, fl um, the floodgates or whatever to create electricity, the amount of water increases big time. So sure, you still have the people downstream that are still getting the water. That's a blessing. But now, beyond the water, now you've got electricity that will power millions of people. For instance, the Hoover Dam. Do you know that it provides 4 billion kilowatts of electricity per, uh, per year? It powers the homes and businesses for 1.3 million people in the states of Nevada, Arizona, and California. So you've got the river, which is a blessing for those along the river, but then when you turn on that power, it blesses more than just those people along the way. It blesses so many people. It blesses millions of people. Well... Maybe you can think of the Holy Spirit pre-Pentecost, post-Pentecost in the same analogy. Before Pentecost, the work of the Holy Spirit was, it was less evident and was primarily with the people of Israel, right? And it blessed the people because it came upon their leaders for certain tasks, for certain times. God displayed his power primarily for the big offense and the prophets, the priests, and the kings. God's people were blessed by it, but then, after Pentecost, the Holy Spirit's work is just unleashed and the church is created and it's grown and millions of people, millions of individuals experience the Holy Spirit's indwelling. They come to Christ through faith because the Holy Spirit brings them to faith and the Holy Spirit then works the fruit of the Spirit in their life and then other people are affected by them as well. You see the, the difference maybe, the, the distinction between pre-Pentecost and post-Pentecost. Moses' words, they have come true for us. Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that means proclaim God's word, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Had it not been for the outpowering of the Holy Spirit, you and I would not be sitting here today. 
right? Why would we? We would not be able to confess Jesus is Lord without the Holy Spirit. We cannot do that. We would not be putting on a VBS for about 150 kids. Why would we bother? Why would we take the time if we didn't have the Holy Spirit in us and we wanted to share the Holy Spirit with these 150 kids coming up in a couple of weeks? We wouldn't be feeding 700 people hamburgers and hot dogs on July 4th. Why would we take the time? Why would we take the effort? It's because of the Holy Spirit in us that we want to share what the Holy Spirit has done in our life. We want to build that relationship with those 700 people here. I know it's hard to in one day, but we can try. Make them feel comfortable here in our place so maybe they'll come back and realize the benefits of the Holy Spirit that's in word and sacrament for them too. If it weren't for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't feel any need, we wouldn't have any need to come here every week to receive the word of forgiveness, to receive the word of God's grace, to receive the word, the sacrament, the body and blood of Jesus, in, with, and under that bread and wine. Why would we? But because we've been filled with the Holy Spirit, we see the benefits of a life lived in Christ Jesus. So, Moses' words found fulfillment when Jesus sent the Holy Spirit for his church. So, Moses' words still find fulfillment every time we confess, Jesus is Lord. So Moses' words find fulfillment every time we see the Holy Spirit active in our lives. So let's pray. Thank you, Lord God, for sending your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord God, that he indwells with each of us in our baptisms. We praise you, Lord God, that the Holy Spirit brings us to faith, nurtures our faith through the word, enlivens our faith, enables us, equips us to speak our faith to those who don't yet have the Holy Spirit living in them. Holy Spirit, help us by your power to live the Christ-centered life that you call us to. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.